All right. Hey, Alexandra. Hey, Felipe. It's so amazing to talk to you. I love your film. I can't believe that you went on a two-year journey. I mean, only to start with. It ended up being eight years after that. But I mean, how did you get the inspiration to do that? I had all started with the book. My dad used to read me Chifley's Ride when I was a little kid. The epic tale of Aim Chifley, a Swiss school teacher who rode all the way from Argentina to New York in 1925 on horseback. I love horses. My parents gave me the name Felipe because it means a friend of horses. And uh, it just became my life's dream to one day go on my own long ride. Now, in the movie, you say that your parents and you moved to Toronto from Brazil. And after that, you didn't get a whole lot of riding experience. Yeah, from the time that you were in Toronto to the time where you leave on your long journey in Calgary, how much riding did you get? So uh, when I arrived in Canada, I was nine years old and, uh, you know, as an immigrant family, uh, fresh off the boat, as we say, off the plane in the 21st century, uh, we didn't have a lot of money, you know, so horses are expensive and, and the horse completely left my life for a few years. But interestingly enough, when my parents started to get the, you know, started getting their feet um, under them and, and uh, they sent me out to do a trip out west to the Calgary Stampede. And uh, at this time I was about 15 years old and I remember being at the rodeo and seeing tie down roping and it was like the world went into slow motion and there was something very innate, very strong within me that said, you know, this is what's missing from your life. You got to get back in the saddle. When I returned to Ontario, uh, immediately I talked to my dad. We found the Ontario Rodeo Association, uh, the Roping Association and a great cowboy in Ontario by the name of Jason Thompson took me under his wing. So from about 15 years old till uh, university, I was very involved in the high school rodeo association. Um, I qualified two years in a row for the national finals uh, in tie down roping. So uh, yeah, the cowboy had the, the boots and the horses came back to my life. And that's why I departed from the Calgary Stampede when it came time to ride back to Brazil. Got it. And at what point did you decide to turn this into a film? Because we see you right from the beginning of the long journey. Yeah, so very early on, you know, I ended up studying journalism at uh, Ryerson University. And when I began building the project, it wasn't just, you know, it's my dream to go on this epic journey on this long ride. It was also to document the Americas, uh, to document the people I would meet, their plight, their happiness, their, you know, everything that was going on. Because you travel so slowly, uh, three to four kilometers an hour, you require so much help. You're with horses. They're live animals, you know, with a bike, you can just lay it down at the end of the day. With a car, you turn it off, get a hotel room, you travel thousands of kilometers in a single day. Um, so the horse really puts you into people's homes and, and I wanted to document it as a journalist and try to inspire a more just world. So as soon as I began planning, I began filming. So as, you, as you've seen in the film, it's literally the entire journey from the day I started planning to the day I, I stepped down from the saddle. There are different cameras involved, like at points you have, I think, a cell phone in your hand and you're filming, which is crazy. Like you were on that that crazy, dangerous highway and you have an iPhone in your hand. You're you've got you're ponying two horses. I was like, yikes. I like I was like crossing my fingers. You were going to be OK. And you were. <laughs> um, but also you have a GoPro at one point and at some point yeah. it looks like there's somebody filming you so I don't think anybody came with you on the journey did you meet people along the way who had cameras who were filming? Uh, no so in order to uh, undertake this journey I uh, sold the project to a production company in the states uh, first and they're, they're the ones that financed the entire trip and they loaded me with all the cameras I had uh, two big Sony cameras I had two GoPros I had uh, about 100 cards. I would shoot card A and B with the same camera. So then I would once a month FedEx card A to them, keep B. When they had it in their hard drive, I could then film on B just to make sure we didn't lose uh, any of the footage. So what you're going to see out there is a very personal diary, um, which I was shooting the whole time with all these different uh, cameras. And then I would also meet friendly strangers. You know, I'd stay at your house. And the next morning, I'd be like, hey, do you mind filming me as I ride out of your house? I'd give you the the 10 second, uh, you know, how to do it, count in your head, don't move the camera a lot. And then obviously when I got it, it was like half my body, you know, the sky moving, but uh, we made it work. And I think that's one of the most special parts of this. I, although at times as the director of photography on this film, uh, you know, I was like, oh my God, if I could be on top of that mountain shooting me, you know, riding against the sunset, this would be the most epic 
shot ever in the middle of Yellowstone National Park. I couldn't do that, uh, but it also created this very special, um, all these moments that if I had arrived at these people's homes with, you know, a cinematographer, a director, a producer, we wouldn't have captured these stories. You know, I wouldn't have gone into that drug lord's house and spent three days with him. You know, I wouldn't have seen the things I'd seen him captured, uh, the things I captured because I was filming everything by myself. And then we also had uh, certain points where uh, cinematographers came out in important moments we shot with a red in Texas. You know, we got some epic 4K footage uh, when I arrived in Calgary as the parade marshal in 2020 to wrap up the entire thing. My arrival in Bajeto is 40,000 people. The statue they built of me, we hired someone uh, to film that as well. But I'd say 90% of, of what you see uh, was shot by righty and, and lefty, which is my right and my left hand and the tripod that I had to set up. <laughs> And did you plan stops ahead at specific ranches or did you just bunk down wherever you were? So the majority is bunk down wherever you are, but uh, there were some points like uh, Bruiser, one of my horses, uh, was donated by Copper Spring Ranch, one of the biggest ranches in the U.S. and Montana. So I knew leaving Calgary, that would be a perfect place to, uh, you know, wind down and recharge the batteries. It took me a couple months to get there. Once we got there, I spent, uh, spent a week there. Uh, but the majority is you wake up, saddle your horses, you're riding eight to 10 hours a day uh, to cover these uh, 30 kilometers. You don't want to do any more than that for the animals and for yourself as well. You get really tired because uh, I'm walking and riding. You know, I, I walk about five to 10 kilometers a day to help the horses. And, and at the end of the day, you just look around and if there's a ranch, you knock on the door. If there's a house, you knock on the door. If there's nothing, you look for a tree where you can tie the horses. And as long as there's some water for them and some grass for them to eat, then you set up your tent and get up the next day and go again. In the film, it lists how many shoes you went through during this two-year journey. Where did you find farriers along the way? Uh, so again, you wear many hats when you go on a journey like this. You end up being the cameraman, the diplomat, the lawyer, the farrier, the vet. So I would shoe the horses uh, when there was no farriers. Um, I can cowboy shoe Jason Thompson, who I named at the beginning of this uh, interview, the great Canadian cowboy who took me under his wing. Uh, taught me how to rope and taught me how to shoe. We didn't have a lot of money. Uh, so he taught me how to rope and I would help him shoe in exchange uh, for the knowledge that he, he gave me. Uh, so yeah, this, this helped me out a lot. There were some countries like Guatemala, Honduras. I had to travel to the capital to find shoes that would fit my horses. Frenchie was a really big horse as you guys will see in the film. My kid, this beautiful Palomino, but his hoof was like the size of a racket. And you go to these little Central American countries and the horses all have tiny little pony hooves. So I'd have to travel to the capital, find a place where they did jumping or something like that, or dressage. And usually those are bigger animals. And then I have to buy the shoes and then go back and, and nail them on myself. And it wasn't easy, but we got it, we got it through more than 300 horseshoes on our first journey. So on the journey, you pony either one or two horses. Yes, and ma'am. Was that because horses don't like to be on their own? I mean, I know you were carrying things as well, but did it make it safer? Yeah, for sure. Horses are herd animals. You know, they, they, they're they in a society. That's what makes them feel safe. Every instinct they have is based on what's going on in that society. Have you ever heard of, you know, people say horses can, can smell fear. Don't go up to a horse scared. And that's so true. And, and why is that? It's an instinct of survival. If one of those animals in that herd is afraid and they smell that fear, they know, hey, there's a bear coming after us. There's a lion that's going to eat us and we need to fly or fight. We need to get out of here. So um, horses feel a lot safer uh, within their group in herds, uh, but also I needed to carry my equipment, right? I, I had no uh, support vehicles, so it was one horse you're riding, the next one is carrying the pack saddle with all your things. And in the southern U.S., um, when I got to Wyoming, still kind of northern, uh, a rancher gave me a third horse. He's like, hey, a, a trip like you, you need three horses. So he gave me Texas, the third horse. And then I, I learned that with the three horses, I could alternate. All of a sudden, one of the horses was walking with nothing on its back. And that helped tremendously. Horses in nature, wild horses will walk uh, 30 to 40 to 50 kilometers a day in search of water and feed. So that's very natural for them, the act of walking. But uh, having the weight on their back, that helped to have one horse uh, to alternate. So that's why we took the three horses on the first trip. Before this journey, did you ever think that you could develop a bond like you did with Frenchy? dude and bruiser? 100%. You know, I wasn't doing this. Uh, I wasn't reinventing the wheel. 
Chifley's Ride, that book, that was my Bible. I read it, uh, you know, front to back a million times, digested that book literally uh, growing up. And then as I was planning this trip and I knew uh, from the book that that was going to be the most special part of the trip, you know, Aim Chifley wrote Mancha and Gato. And by the end of the journey, they were an extension of his body. And he talked about that bond that he had with those animals for the rest of his life. Uh, so I knew that, that that's ultimately one of the big themes of this. One of the big parts of me wanting to do this was I wanted to build my own connection with horses in that manner. And uh, like I say in the, in the movie, they're my kids. Uh, they're my children. They're a part of my heart. I love those animals so much. Um, and uh, the bond that we created is something that very few uh, humans will get to do, especially nowadays when we're connected with machines like our phones and our computers and our cars and, and very few of us have such strong connections with animals. And it's just so beauty because, um, you know, horses are like children. Um, they're very truthful. They just give you, you know, there's no BS. If they like you, they like you. If they don't, they don't. Um, and uh, yeah, I love that. I love that very much about uh, animals and, and everything that they give you. You know, you end up getting way more from the horses than they get from you. And like I've said, and I say in the film, uh, the horse has made me a better human being. I've learned so much lessons uh, from these animals. And uh, it's such an enriching experience to have such a strong connection with animals. It really is. I can say that for sure for myself. Um, having yeah. ridden on roads, myself as well I know how scary it is and I mean sometimes people they're just trying to be polite and, and say hi and so they honk at you which can actually yeah. scare the heck out of your horse um how bomb proof were your horses um so to start off with they were they weren't very bomb proof I met the first horses seven days before I left the Calgary Stampede um so that was tough Frenchie hadn't been ridden in many years uh, when I started working with him, you'll see in the beginning of the film, he, you know, I almost die. I, I get bucked off, break my finger, rip my pants, uh, bruise my ego. I'm like, oh, my God, how am I going to leave in the largest rodeo in Canada? It's like six days at this point. But uh, you cowboy up, you know, that's something that uh, I think ultimately allowed me to begin and finish these journeys was growing up with a dad that wears, you know, a cowboy hat and uh, spurs. It's tough. You know, it's tough when you're a kid and you're always being tested and, but it ultimately uh, creates someone that's ready for war. And, and I knew that I just needed to get that horse to trust me and, and work with him. And, and uh, the more I worked with him, the easier it got. And by the time I got to New Mexico, they were bomb proof. But uh, it took a few months. And like you said, you know, people honk. A lot of people don't know what a horse is anymore. So there were points on those journeys where I'm riding. And if I stick my arm out, the transport trucks would have hit me. Um, and I'm with three horses and uh, it was very dangerous. A lot of people ask me, why don't you take more trails and, and backcountry roads? It's like, well, when you're riding from Canada to Brazil, there isn't backcountry roads. You know what I mean? Like, it's great if you're going to ride through Yellowstone and do a little trip to the U.S. You know, there's a couple guys uh, a few years ago uh, that shot a beautiful film called Unbranded. And they rode from um, the border of uh, uh, Mexico in the U.S. to the border of Canada in the U.S. You know, and they rode a lot of backcountry, a lot of backcountry, and uh, but I couldn't, you know, because that was like one percent of what I did. You know what I mean? Like my trip was uh, ten times what they did, and and when you get to countries like Central America and Mexico and Brazil, there aren't trails that you can follow. So it was really dangerous. It was really hard. It made the the ride hell at times. It made me not want to do it at times. Um, but I feel very blessed that I'm still alive today due to all the close calls, the majority of them, roads. I know one was a Mustang. What were the other two breeds? Uh, so I ended up using quarter horses on the first journey, French and Bruiser quarter horses, uh, Mustang dude. And then on the second journey from Brazil to Ushuaia, the southern tip of South America, uh, because I suffered so much at the borders of the first journey, I crossed 10 international borders. Every border was so hard to get through. I ended, ended up doing each country with its own horse. And I used quarter horses. And in uh, Argentina, I actually rode two Criollos uh, that were of the same bloodline of Mancha and Gato um, given to me by the same family that gave Aim Chifley his horses uh, more than 100 years ago. And uh, I ended up leaving from the ranch where Ch Chifley's uh, ashes are and the horse's bones are buried, Mancha and Gato. So that was, you know, it was like full circle for me and a really cool experience. Now you spent eight years doing these long rides what are you doing now 
Uh, so now I'm wrapping up the project and you know, I'm writing, writing my third book. I released two books already. Uh, they became bestsellers on the first two parts, uh, uh, on the first two journeys, long ride home, long ride to the end of the world. And now I'm writing last long ride. Uh, we'll release it at the Calgary Stampede this year. We just wrapped, wrapped up the film, you know, this uh, documentary, The Long Rider. And now we're going to festivals around the world. We did uh, the, the world premiere was at Buford International Film Festival. We took home uh, the audience award, which was awesome. And, uh, and now it's wrapping up these projects and uh, starting the next project. As a journalist, uh, I want to show culture through the horse, uh, through Western culture. And uh, that's, that's going to be the next project. Where do you live now? And do you have horses of your own? Uh, so I'm living in Calgary right now. Uh, I spend the winter up here. I'll be going back to Ontario for the summer for all the premieres we're doing. And uh, But my base is still in Brazil, my parents' ranch, uh, where the horses are down there in the interior of Sao Paulo. And uh, I'm always back and forth. I do a lot of motivational talks in Brazil. But uh, ultimately, I'm trying to stay in Canada. I love this country. It's another theme in the, in the movie. We talk about uh, my immigration process, what I went through with my parents at an early age. And uh, although I feel Canadian, my heart beats uh, to, you know, to this great nation. I, I love it so much. My passport doesn't say Canadian yet. So we're trying to work on that. That's amazing. I, I just, I love the movie. I hope everybody watches it because especially uh, of course, of course, lovers are going to love this movie. Thank you so much for talking to me today. It's been so amazing. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Love the pillows and it was nice <laughs> meeting your cat as well. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Felipe. Take care.